Welcome to the first installation of Art Through Time. I am your host, Jake Ledbetter. Accompany me as I take a deep dive into the riching past and what encompasses the identity of all cultures, art. We shall journey into ancient eras through European caves, Egyptian tombs, and Greek and Roman societies. We shall cover medieval art before bearing witness to the rise of the Renaissance. The wonders of the Islamic and Byzantine world will be critically analyzed and paid homage to. Asia, Africa, Australia, the Americas, all corners of the globe will be unearthed in the most significant of visual art discussed. Even more current art shall be covered. As an artist, especially one with the goal of being professional, finding and maintaining inspiration is the most crucial factor in my longevity and success. One's fire must be nurtured. It must be fed. For this purpose, art from any time has the potential to be relevant. Let us begin. Within the caves of Europe, prominently in the Pyrenees, the mountain range straddling the border of France and Spain, the oldest art known to man can be found. These cave paintings and found on-site carved sculptures have been dated to have been created from 40 to 14,000 BC, a span of time stretching in between the last ice age, the late Pleistocene, and the old stone age, the Paleolithic eras. This period, notably, encompasses nearly three quarters of humanity's pursuance of art. France's most famous and rich cave is the Lascaux cave system. With 2,000 depictions, the cave house is 10% of all prehistoric French cave art. These mostly animal renderings are dated to have been created from 18 to 15,000 BC, with polychrome paintings of Longo animals jumping from the darkness we are offered a rare lens to view into the mysterious past of our ancient story. We are offered a memory. They enjoyed it then, and we enjoy it now. Regardless of time, we are bonded to the artist, such is the nature of art. The most celebrated chamber in the Luskow Cave, and arguably all caves, is the Hall of the Bulls. This section, often referred to as the Sistine Chapel of Prehistory, is comprised of nine horse, six deer, a bear, and seven aurochs, which are extinct wild oxen. Some of these renderings are larger than life. The deer have been depicted with antlers exaggerated in size and organic in form. Their heads are small and precise, while the shape of their bodies are captured accurately with attention to detail. Notice here how the form of the belly slopes in towards the rear, and how the angle of the hind leg is realistically illustrated. Artistic license shines brightly through this painting of a horse. The animal is partly colored in with a red, and the areas in which he was chosen to be colored hug the muscular form of the animal. The line of work, which shifts in weight and boldness, is simple but on point to a T. This bison is undoubtedly the most accomplished cave painting on this blue ball. Because of its sophistication, it took two decades for specialists to accept its authenticity after its discovery in 1879. Its proportions and attention to gradients is masterful. The shadows, juxtaposed against the highlights, push the depth of this piece to artistic level not yet seen. Take note of how the artist uses small repetitive marks to illustrate areas of longer hair and how larger expressive marks were utilized throughout the body for the purpose of making the piece more interesting. This prehistoric cave painting is truly on another level. Let us take a giant leap across space and time and place the culturally rich island of Japan under the microscope. The inventive people of this country have continuously pushed the envelope of the sophistication of a deep array of visual art mediums, be it ceramics, metalwork, sculpture, or painting. By the time Buddhism spread in Japan, buying the country tire to East Asia, their style, knit entirely to a spiritual connection to nature, had already emerged. The combination of historical events and the introduction of Buddhist teachings both played key roles in bringing forth new stylistic developments in iconography to Shinto, the country's ancient native religion of ancestor deities and nature spirits. The discovery of large, coil-built vessels decorated with swirling designs have been made in the Shinano River Valley. These vessels, dubbed the flame-style vessels due to their fire-like patterns, have been dated to have been created from 35 to 1500 BC. Take note of how the base presents designs of vertical in nature, how the middle section harbors more complex spiraling motifs, 
and how small triangular patterns border the top. The actual significance of these vessels is uncertain, but I feel the name assigned to them encapsulates them justly. The introduction of a new religion into Japan inspired the country and propelled the relationship with sculptures to a new height. Large wooden sculptures, usually commissioned for religious reasons, soon became a cemented fixture into their society. The way the artist was able to capture the character of this monk's face is astonishing. His overall form and subtle wrinkles harbor so much stoic energy, but the one aspect that intrigues me personally is the realism of his robes. I am always fascinated by a creative and skillfully rendered robe. I admire the way they hug the human form and overlay upon itself in a visually appealing manner. Draping seems to be an area of expertise in and of itself. For this one, in respect to the robe, the artist presents a great deal of information with minimal input. Here, the drapings of the robe comes across as extremely stylized and almost patternized. Here, they are used to convey a turbulent environment. Even robes shown in 2D work, such as this one, have an iconic style evolved in Japan. Fluid marks of varying weight ending in sharp flourishes is commonplace in much of Japanese art. Notice how bold and expressive this piece is, how the leaves of the bamboo overlay robes that say so much with so little. The marks on this piece are thin, yet they are extremely decisive, pushing forth a crisp image. Here we have a warrior atop giant green crab in an ocean storm. The simplicity of his fierce face contrasts greatly with the dense complexity of the surrounding pattern designs. Take note of the level of intricacy throughout the majority of the piece and then behold the pure black form of his hair and the cartoonish makeup of his face. This difference in approach pushes the face to the foreground of our perception, vivifying it greatly. Ukeo, or rather, the floating world, was a term used to describe the lifestyle, culture, especially the pleasure-seeing aspects associated with Japan's Edo time period, which lasted from 1600 to 1867. During this time, multicolored woodblock prints became a keystone facet of Japan's artistic identity. Aristocratic activities, landscapes, and especially things, you know, a little erotic in nature, became common subject matter for this medium. But let's keep it PG though, guys, and keep our focus on some dope landscapes. This plum tree garden has a peaceful aura and presents a good sense of layered depth. From the foreground, where a single tree is present, to the background, where faint hints of men can be discerned. This windy scene, focused mostly on a cloudless sky, also has an advanced sense of depth, this time at the bottom of the piece, where houses fade away into the distance and Mount Fuji eventually stands. Here, where pedestrians are caught in a harsh rainfall, all edges of the bridge are meticulously straight and no repetitive detail goes unrecorded. The same goes for the man-made structures in this print where yellow nudges the piece into serve reality. The undoubtedly most famous Ukiyo woodblock print was created by Katsusiki Hokusai. They call it the Great Wave, this piece, I wager we all recognize, has influenced my own personal approach to waves. The way the water pulls, pushes, and crashes so organically is powerful. The white foam forms strokes which give shape to the surface of the lively water and the manner in which the wave is spilling over like a hand reaching into space is classic. Now, let us leapfrog through time and shift our gaze to the west where my personal favorite art movement has taken form. In the 1924 scene of Paris, taking root from its forebearers, Cubism, Futurism, and most closely related, Dadaism, the art movement made famous by Salvador Dali and Frida Kahlo, Surrealism, spawned. Spreading across the globe like wildfire, it surpassed its peers in dwarfing prevalence. The definition of Surrealism is as follows. Psychic automatism in its pure state by which one proposes to express in any manner the actual functioning of thought. In other words, surrealism is one's expression through the lens of the subconsciousness. Thus, dreamlike pieces where the strange and unfeasible are accepted were produced. 
Surrealism is best known for its 2D oil paintings, but the 3D work produced from this movement is definitely worth a deep gander. This depiction of a cup, plate, and spoon created by Merritt Oppenheim takes something trivial and mundane and subverts it into something useless yet thrilling. We have Dolly to thank for this weird one where a lobster is positioned onto a telephone. Both of these century-year-old pieces are said to have underlining suggestive messages, but besides the fact that a lobster happens to be an aphrodisiac, I fail to see authentic connections, and uh, never have I associated the relationship between a cup and a spoon with suggestive symbolism. But I do think it would be safe to assume an artist would go to great lengths to widen and inflate a piece's meaning to the popular sexual realm. As far as current 3D surrealist work goes, there is some true talent in the field. Back to surrealism star child Salvador Dali. Explore this painting, dubbed The Persistence of Memory, where the naturally concrete form of clocks representing time is soft, malleable, and melting. Dali claimed the conception of this visual concept came from him witnessing a block of cheese melt on a hot day. The dreamlike cliffs in the distance pushed the surrealism of the absurd composition with the realistic presentation of itself. The more lifelike the environment is, the more likely you are to accept the rest of the painting despite its deviation from reality. Take notice of the ants, a recurring subject matter in much of Dolly's work, representing death and decay. Rather graphically, this symbolic idea came from an early memory from Dolly when he came across a dying bat covered in ants. Here we have the 1946 painting, The Temptation of St. Anthony, created by Dali. The view and angle of the horse gives us an interesting reference of position. The creativity and realism of the structures on the backs of the elephants are inspiring. The weight supporting and eerily long skinny legs of the creatures give off a great sense of layered depth and present an area of thoughtful composition. This painting was made in response to an art contest propagated by a film production company and was the only entry Dolly ever put forth to a contest. Max Ernst was declared the winner with his version of Anthony's Temptation and the film The Private Affairs of Bellamy used his painting in its production. Talk about a trippy and unsettling scene. This is the stuff of nightmares. Originally, the Surrealist movement was heavily involved in the political landscape. With that in mind, here is Salvador Dali's 1943 painting, Geopoliticus, Child Watching the Birth of the New Man. It is hard not to easily draw a few symbolic references. If you recognize the global presentation of Earth on the egg, and you factored in the date of the painting's conception, then maybe you drew the conclusion that the hatching of the egg represents the coming to life or the rebirth to a new status of the United States. The man's hand is harshly gripping Europe and the UK, perhaps on a path for the United States to obtain a new dominant tier other pre-existing alpha nations had to be nerfed in stature. This painting was done during World War II, a war that undeniably propelled the United States status into a superpower. This miserable looking woman could be the spirit of Mother Earth. This crazy sharp umbrella or shroud could be taken as the blessing support of a higher power casting protection upon our nation's rebirth. Arigato for coming aboard my thought train. I hope you found the journey entertaining and insightful. If you want to gain access to the rest of the upcoming Art Through Time videos, and you wish to support my artistic endeavors, then I invite you to subscribe to my Patreon, Ledbetter Art. Patreon is a well-respected platform designed to build a incentivized and tiered monetary connection between artists and their patrons. For $3 a month, you gain access to all future monthly Art Through Time videos. For $12 a month, you obtain the added benefit of gaining a monthly NFT, which would be a digital drawing made into a cryptocurrency connection. If you don't have a crypto wallet, then your ownership would be solidified with a handshake deal till the time you wish to literally click on your accumulated NFTs. Also, in this tier, your name would be concatenated into the credits of the Art Through Time videos. In the final Apex tier subscription, for $38 a month, in addition to the previous benefits, 
you will receive a tri-monthly spray paint stencil painting, add a monthly shirt sporting my original art to your closet, and gain access to God Complex City, my wildly offensive and uncouth in progress sci-fi fantasy novel about a humanoid dragon trying to find his way in the midst of a war between angels, demons, and aliens. Along with the progressing novel, you will have access to witness the development of my true baby, God Complex City, the cartoon show. An estimated one clip shall be dropped per month. Inch by inch, life is a cinch. Experience my journey by supporting my production. Us Vita saying. In the next iteration of Art Through Time, we'll journey into the ancient Middle East, where the first cities propagated and the written languages evolved. From there, we'll segue into the dark ages of medieval Europe, a road from light into darkness. It is impossible to truly digest this transition without paying a due respect to religion. I'm no Christian, but if you were to ask me, Hey Jake, if you could meet one person living or dead, who would it be? I would say Jesus before Leonardo. I love Jesus. He's not Santa Claus. He's not a myth. He's just the most prominent historical figure ever to grace earth. So obviously he gained a legendary status. The dude resurrected people. Maybe, maybe not. People believed he did, though. That's how awesome he was. And again, I'm not a Christian, but I full heartedly accept his wisdom unequivocally sent shockwaves into reality. God or not, he had godlike intelligence. Dude was smart. This being said, I'm not trying to push religion. This is an art series. I'm here firstly for the sexy Sumerian reliefs and the dope castle architecture, but it would be a flawed design to leave the god word out of the conversation. Only time will tell to what degree my biased opinions bleed into your viewing. We will conclude episode 2 with a comprehensive dissection of Banksy, the most prolific and hyped fine artist of our time period. Period. Period.